three days. And I now know why I need to pray. I cannot afford to go to hell. Because I can't take your gun in heat. Amen. Bless the Lord. Amen. Whoa. Amen. I'm hot. Amen. God bless you guys. We are excited. Amen. We're getting ready to go into week two. I think I have only one more week left. I'm sure of it. I'm positive. Next week will probably be short. Oh, I'm taking my time. <laughs> Amen. So bless the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just come in the name of Jesus and we thank you, oh God. We thank you for your word, God. We thank you for understanding and wisdom. We thank you, Father God, that our hearts are prepared to receive on tonight. We've brought in our scattering thoughts, oh God. We've laid them to the side and laid them on the altar as your servant has prayed for us, God. So we're ready to move forward, oh God, in your word. We thank you, God that you are now opening up the eyes and ears of our understanding, that we will learn and glean of you on tonight, God. We thank you for everyone that's on their way, God. Allow them to get here safely. We thank you for our audience that's watching, oh God, on YouTube, God. We thank you that their homes, oh God, are steady in the name of Jesus. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Bless this name, amen. We're going to pick up where we left off. Because last week we said, come on out for the, for the next chapter. Next week we'll have the conclusion of the matter. Amen. We're going to go back to chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 7. Our goal is to go from verse 7 to verse 19 on tonight. The only way I'll have a verse of week 3 is if I don't get through the verses tonight. So don't be praying against me, Brother Bell. Don't be praying against me. I'm going to get through tonight. Amen. Matthew 11, starting at verse 7, and it says, And they went away. As, as they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you come out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, those born among those, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? This is when it's starting to get tight, y'all. It's going to get real tight around this way. We're going to bring it on home. It is, like, it is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he is a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Wow. That's a lot. And we're going to try and get through all of that tonight. Like I said, we only have week four if we don't get through this tonight. But I think we will. Amen. So first of all, we're going to jump out here and it says, the he says, um, what did you come out to see? Amen. And we left off right there. We were just describing John the Baptist. We're going to get back into describing a little bit more of John the Baptist tonight because each section of this tells us a little bit more about John. Amen. It brings a little bit more of John's life out. In the comparison to the Old Testament, we're going to bring Elijah into it. So um, get your fingers on First Kings and Second Kings and Leviticus because we're going to go to the Old Testament, and I often tell people, if you cannot find Jesus in the Old Testament, then you do not know him. You do not know him. 
because he is in every single book of the Bible. There's a, someone, I forget who wrote the book, it's called The Scarlet Thread, and it is a, it is a track from Genesis to Revelations, uh, The Blood Trail from Genesis to Revelations, a really good book. Uh, if you, I forget who wrote it now, but it's called The Scarlet Thread. I read it years ago um, when I was doing a study on um, friendship. And we had to do a study on friendship, and that was my assignment, and I had to do one on the, the uh, covenant between two people, the one that Jonathan and David made. And the one that we make when we get married, we just don't realize that's what we're doing. If we would perform that ceremony at weddings, we'd have a lot less trouble with people. But it's a long ceremony, so we don't, we've cut it down, reversed it down to what we do now. Amen? So now, first off, we're going to go right on to, into this Persian. We're going to say, what did you come out to see? He said, what? A reed shaken by the wind? My good sister has equipped me with the weed. A reed? Don't worry, I'm not going to hit nobody with it, even though it's tempting. That's not a switch, it's a reed. See, somebody, somebody been through the program. Amen. So they said, what did you come out to see? A reed shaken by the wind. And I'm very curious. I've always, I grew up trying to figure out what they was talking about. I'm not, I'm not the only one. Some of the stuff, I'm like, well, what you mean by that? Just please tell me something. Amen. And so when I started researching a reed, uh, reeds were great in quantity in the Jordan. They grew up to 20 feet high. They were fresh and green when all else seems to be dead and dry in that region. Now, in all regions, they're not like that. But in that particular region, the reeds are fresh and green when everything else around them appears to be dead and dry. Remember that because we're going to bring it on home in a minute. They made shelter for birds and animals. You can find that in Job 40 and 21. We will not go to all the scriptures tonight because there's so many. Your homework is for you to read them yourself. Job 40, 40 and 21 tells you of how the reeds were made shelters for birds and animals. God is amazing, isn't he? However, they are hollow. Do, 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 do. You can see right through it. They are hollow and they're easily tossed back to and fro by the wind. Okay? So Jesus Christ is asking them, what did you come to see? Did you come a, to see a reed shaken by the wind? And he's still talking about John the Baptist, remember now. So now he's, he's getting ready to dispel everything that they're thinking about John the Baptist because now he's sent the disciples on their way. Amen? So he said, what? So now the, 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 the metaphor to that is this. A reed is shaken by the wind is a metaphor, is a Hebrew metaphor that says it, it stands for a weakling who lacks conviction and is easily swayed by opinion. Easily swayed by opinion. Somebody get 1 Kings 14 and 15 and someone get 2 Kings 18 and 21. Easily swayed by opinion it's unsteady, it's unbelieving, it speaks one thing one day and another thing the next day. So Jesus was contrasting and commending John the Baptist for his steadiness as his forerunner. He was saying, that's not John. Did you come out to see somebody that's going to be shaken? You came to the wrong place. Get your money back because there's nobody shaking over here. John the Baptist is solid. Amen? Amen. You pay, if you bought a ticket, get your money back. 1 Kings 14 and 15. And I didn't write these down, so somebody got to find it real quick. I got you. Okay. 1 so Kings. Kings 14, 15. Mm -hmm. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of the good, out of the good land which he gave to their fathers and shall scatter them beyond the river because they have made their groves provoking the Lord to anger. Amen. Second Kings 18 and 21. On Egypt, if you lean on Egypt, it will be like a reed, a reed that splinters beneath your weight and pierces your hand. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, is completely unreliable completely unreliable and so that's the comparison Jesus Christ is saying what did you come to see 
did you see, come to see somebody that is broken down and confused? And he said, well, that's not John the Baptist, so you came to the wrong place. And when I was reading this, the thing that came to my mind is for me, my personal message for me was, be careful who you allow to provide shelter for you. Be careful who you allow to provide shelter for you. Because some people, they say one thing one day, they jump on the bandwagon, they fare with other friends. When you up, they up. When you down, they down. When you in, they in. When you out, they out. They don't have any kind of foundation for themselves. And they're tossed and they're easily swayed by the opinions of others. And he's saying John the Baptist is not like that. Amen? So Jesus was making sure, he was making them sure of John's character. The indication was that John the Baptist was a firm, resolute man and not a reed shaken by the wind. He was solid. He was not watering, wavering in his, in his principles, nor uneven in his conversation but was remarkable for his steadiness and constant, const, constant consistency within himself. They who are weak as reeds will be shaken as reeds, but John was strong in the spirit. And you can find that, the strength of that is Ephesians 4 and 14. Ephesians 4 and 14. And somebody can grab that and read that real quick. Ephesians 4, I should have uh, printed them out. Ephesians 4 and 14. Ephesians 4. I got it. Ephesians 4 and 14. Okay, go ahead. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. There you go. Jesus Christ is saying, look, you're not going to, John the Baptist is, is strong. And his desire is, now this is coming to Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is all about God's gifts, but it's also all about God's uh, message to the, to the children directly. And he said, look, I don't want you to be tossed back and fro. I don't want you to be easily swayed by somebody's opinion. I want you to be solid in the word. And that's why we come together and we break the word down and we find out what it means so we're not easily tossed. Because some people, they're so emotional in their teaching, and I wasn't here on Sunday, so I, I understand that pastor talked about emotions, but they're so emotional uh, that they're just so easy to just jump on whatever's being said. I, I've had people that have gone to a conference. I said, what was the conference about? Girl, we had a good time, and it was just this, 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 this. I said, but, but what was the word about? Oh, girl, I don't know, but we had a good time. You can't even tell me the scripture the person came from? Girl, I don't remember, but I just know we had a good time. Okay. Emotionally driven. People are emotionally driven. Emotions have a very loud voice. So you have to control them. Uh, my husband always tells me, don't make decisions when you're emotional, because, you know, I'd, be, I'd take something to run with, I'd be ready to go. He had to reel me in and said, babe, just calm down. We're going to, it's going to be all right. Just calm down. Good grief. Amen. I know he'd be rolling his eyes, but he don't do it at me, but I know he probably turn his back and roll his eyes a little bit. He probably do. <laughs> Why are you over there laughing? Amen. He probably rolled up at me today. Right now. Well, he rolled. <laughs> but that's okay. Amen. So now, the, so when the wind was popular, Applause blew on one hand, fresh air, and when the storm of Herod's rage came, uh, uh, of course, here comes the fierce one. So he's saying, John the Baptist is the same, and he's unwavering. When, when, when people are up, he's still the same. When people are down, he's still the same. He said he's the reason why you guys flocked to him was because he was solid and he was speaking the word only. Amen. He was, he was the forerunner for Jesus. So he had one message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But what he was really saying was, repent. Jesus is about to walk on the scene. That was the message. 
The kingdom of heaven was Jesus. Amen? The king, that's why we say we have the kingdom of heaven. We do. Why? Because we have Jesus. Amen? He said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus Christ comes behind him and says the kingdom of heaven is here. I am he. It is me that John the Baptist was talking about. I'm the one. It's me. Amen? So now Jesus Christ is talking really. He's telling everybody what John is all about. He never, John, John the Baptist never attempted to steal Jesus is or anyone else's thunder. Never. He would not be goaded into it. Amen? You could not. They even came to him and asked him, who are you? And he says, I'm not the Christ that's coming. I'm not him. I'm not the one. You can find that in John 1, 19 through 23. We're not going to read it tonight, but uh, you can read. That's what you can find in that. John 1, 19 to 23. He says, I am not him. Let's make that plain right now. Who I, I am not the Christ. I'm not, I'm not Elijah. I'm not the Christ. I'm not none of them. He would not step into anyone else's position. He knew what he was there to do. Amen. He was solid. He wasn't a reed. He was solid. So he was letting them know. This is John the Baptist. What your, your, uh, he was clearing up any doubts or opinions of what John the Baptist was and what his mission was and whether or not he fulfilled his mission. Amen. And he stood on it. Again, John 3 and 28, he stood on what he said from the beginning. I am not him. Amen. So now, therefore, this question sent his disciples. Um, the disciples was not to be construed with any suspicion of the truth. He didn't want anybody to be confused on who he was trying to be. He wanted to make sure the people that was following him knew who they were following and why. That's why when Jesus Christ came, John's disciples did what? They stopped following John and started following Jesus. Amen? Because now there was a transition of power and authority. And we said last week the two was not going to be able to exist in the same place at the same time. Amen? Even though they were only born six, six months, three months apart. Six months apart. Three months apart. Because she was pregnant six months when Elizabeth got pregnant. So, uh, when Mary got pregnant. So now, so now he says, what did you come out to see? Amen? What did you come to see? Unlike false prophets, John did not allow himself to be bought by a king who wished to purchase favorable prophecies. John the Baptist would not be bought because the kings would call the prophets out and they would give them a little something, something under the table for them to speak well of them. Amen. And to prophesy goodness on their kingdom. John the Baptist had none of that. Neither did Elijah. None of that. I'm not running out. I cannot be bought. First Kings 22, 13 through 18. First Kings 22, 13 through 18. We won't not read it tonight, but that's for you to read. So that way you can get yourself used to reading and, and figuring the word out. Amen. So unlike false prophets, John did not allow himself to be bought off by a king who wished to purchase favorable prophecies. People are still doing it today. Amen. They purchase favor. So people don't want, they want someone who is prophetic but they don't necessarily want a prophet around them. There's a difference. Someone can be prophetic without being a prophet. The one that's prophetic, you might be able to sway them. Someone who is a prophet, you're not swaying them from what God said. No matter how much you look at them crazy, no matter how much you threaten them, if they said the Lord said this, that's what the Lord said, and they're sticking by it. You're not going to sway them. Amen? They're not driven by their emotions. They don't care about you crying, carrying on, none of that. That was John the Baptist. He came and said, look, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Amen? But they followed him and they flocked to him. Amen? So now, so now he's speaking. Also, he starts speaking about John's clothing. And he's telling everything that Jesus Christ is talking about. John is talking about it. Is building his character resume up. And he's, he's distinguishing John from the average person. In the same way we have to be distinguished from the world, we do, contrary to what people think, have to look separate from the world. We have to be separated from the world all while we're living, living amongst the world. 
We, you got to be separated while you're inside. Because you can't leave this planet. I mean, you can, but it, I it may not be nice for you, but you, you know, you don't want to leave it the wrong way. Amen? So now look, he said, his clothing, he started talking about his clothing in verse 8. He said, he had the soft clothing. He didn't have the soft clothing as the, uh, the kings and the priests wore. He said, speaking of John's clothing, mantles made of silk or linen and, and worn by the gentry of the east in comparison to John's modest and rugged attire. And, they, and that verses, chapter 3, verse 9, tells you about what John wore. The wild camp, the wild hair and ate the locusts and the honey. And John's clothing was similar to Elijah's. Somebody find 2 Kings verse 1 and 8. 2 Kings 1 and 8. And his ministry and lifestyle also paralleled Elijah's. So many people thought he was Elijah, which he actually, in a sense, was because he came in the power and the authority of Elijah, but he was not Elijah himself. 1 Kings 1 and 8. I mean, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 1 and 8. Second. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. And they answered him, he was a hairy man and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. Mm hmm. So he was known for his very modest. He was dressed for where he lived, basically. They lived in the wilderness. He was dressed for the environment that he lived in. Amen. John the Baptist lived in the wilderness. He was dressed for the environment that he lived in. Amen. So look at what he has on. Read again, says 1 and 8. Mm-hmm. Okay, so he wasn't interested in the in being seen with all the bells and the whistles and all the stuff on. I mean, some people, I'm trying to figure out, did you come to preach or be seen? Did you come to teach or did you come to be seen? Because you're looking like the grand poop bar right now. I mean, I'm Fred Flintstone. Anybody that's older than 30 know who the grand poop bar is. <laughs> so we have to be careful that we do not allow ourselves to fall into the place of being seen because of what we're wearing. Because what's really important is the message I came to deliver to you, not what I'm wearing. And that's why a lot of pastors now and, and ministers and teachers are going back to wearing robes again. You notice that you see that a lot now. Because now people are starting to get the revelation, wait a minute, I can't be a distraction to the people by what I got on. I can't let what I'm wearing be a distraction by what I got on. So a lot of people, you're noticing now that a lot of people, especially women, are starting to go back to wearing robes again. You know, the, not a, I'm not saying you got to. I'm just saying some people are going back to it because I think people are starting to get that message. Amen? Amen. So now, and even Elijah had a very strict diet the same way John the Baptist did. John's was locust and wild honey, and this was all considered clean foods. Amen. So really what it's saying is John the Baptist ate a very clean diet. He didn't deviate. He didn't even come close to eating anything that was on the abominations list. Amen. And you can find that in, in, Levit uh, in Le uh, Leviticus chapter 11. We're going to read that in a minute. Leviticus chapter 11. But really it was a clean diet, but it was also considered a diet of the poor. So this is why most people wouldn't eat locusts. Because it was considered poor if you ate that. Which locusts actually in some countries is a delicacy. Now, but back in John the Baptist days, you were considered poor if you ate off the land. Amen? So John the Baptist was a self-denying man uh, and mortified to this world. He was a man clothed. Was he a man clothed in soft raiment? If so, would you have gone to the wilderness to see him? That's the question that's asking the lesson. But to the court. You went out to see the one that had a raiment of camel's hair and a leather girl about his loins. His appearance and habits showed that he was dead to all the pumps of the world and the pleasures of sense. His clothing agreed with the wilderness he lived in and the doctrine he preached, and that was of repentance. He was not concerned with the cares of the world at all. 
He knew his mission, his mission was short, his mission was sweet, and he didn't have time to go try to figure out what the latest fashions was. John was parallel in Elijah in his call for Israel to repent and confrontation with an evil king and his wife. Jesus explained the significance of these parallels in Matthew 11 and Matthew 17. Now we're going to go back, go to Leviticus 11. You guys there yet? Leviticus 11, 20 to 23 says, All winged insects that go on all fours are detestable to you. Yet among the winged insects that go on all fours, you may eat those that have joint legs above their feet and which hop on the ground. Of them you may eat the locusts of any kind, the bald locusts of any kind, the cricket of any kind, and the grasshopper of any kind. But all other winged insects that are on four feet are detestable to you. So John was making sure that he was in compliance with what the Lord said to eat. Now, we had to eat that. Now, we be, look, listen, if somebody tell me I got to eat some locusts and crickets, we're going to have some problems. <laughs> We're going to have some problems. But they're full of protein and other minerals that your body actually needs to survive. Amen? There's a reason why God called out those particular insects. We're going to get into the nutrition side. We're going to leave that alone. I still ain't eating them, though. You're going to have to give me something else, Jesus. Amen? Okay, so second king... Uh, one and eight, we she read that before. It's talked about his clothing. And so now we're going to get on into the meat of the matter on what we're going to do tonight. And that is getting ready now to get on into the prophecy and talking about John the Baptist and comparing him to Elijah and also talking about him being born of Mary. Amen. I mean, not Mary, uh, born of a woman, Elizabeth. Amen. So now they went out to see him. They, instead of going, and see, Jesus Christ is get, asking these questions because he already knows their motive. We have to remember, Jesus Christ is speaking from a place to where he already knows exactly what everybody's thinking. Yeah, he already knows. So he's talking to them from a place of understanding what they're thinking already. So he's dispelling any myth they may have before they can even have them. So he said, look, you went out to see him because you was curious. Who is this wild man in the wilderness that's speaking, dressed, looking like a madman, eating wild locusts and wild honey? So you went out to see him because you were curious. You didn't go out to see him to get your spirit fed. Your motive was wrong in why you went. Amen? And so that's why... A lot of, you'll hear a lot of pastors will say, I'd rather have 10 people that's following me than 50, than, than 50 or 60 that have no idea what we go, what, what's going on. Because you want people that are in these seats that are here intentionally. Amen? Amen. Church is intentional. You don't, and it's optional. You don't have to be in this building to fulfill the scripture that says, for Satan not to assemble yourselves together. You realize that, right? Two people can gather at a coffee shop and fulfill that. But two or three are gathered, he's in the midst of them. You're in these seats because it's intentional. You're being intentional about your faith. You're being intentional about your relationship with Christ. You're being intentional about your growth. You're intentional about being an excellent witness for Christ. You have an intention on doing the right things, the right things, and your motive is where it needs to be. So that's the reason that you come to church. If you're not coming with the, with, the, with the mission to learn something, stay home. Just stay home. Because you're going to get before God is going to burn up in front of him. You'll be in church for 50 years and it'll mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. And so Je Jesus Christ is really speaking harshly to them. When you go back to the New Old Testament and read what he's talking about, he's really rebuking them, and it's only going to get worse on down to chapter verse 30. He's really turning around now and rebuking this generation, and he's getting ready to compare them to some crazy stuff in a minute. Amen? And so this is the part of the scripture, that's what I said, the night won't be as exciting, because <laughs> this is the part of the scripture that we don't want to hear, and we don't like to hear, but we need to hear. As I have to remind everybody, these words are in red. They're not optional. They're in red. That means this is Jesus Christ speaking. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. So now, so he, she says, those born of a woman 
This is a Jewish idiom for a human or natural birth. He said, and Jesus Christ implicitly contrasts this with the new birth to the kingdom of heaven and the one greater. So he said, look, those born of a woman, there was not a greater born of women than John the Baptist. Christ knew how to value persons according to the degrees of their worth. Not respect their persons, but he values them according to the degree of their worth. And he prefers John before all that went before him. Why? Because John fulfilled the mission to the letter. Amen. Before all that were born for a woman. All, all of God, all, all that God had raised up and called by any service to his church, John is the most eminent, even beyond Moses himself. And he began to preach the gospel doctrine of remission of sins to those who truly repented. And he had more signal relationships from heaven than any of them had. For he saw heaven open and he, the Holy Ghost descend. Not very many prophets in the Old Testament has seen heaven open and the Holy Ghost descend. Amen? But because of John's job and what he did, he saw things that prophets before him had not seen. Elijah saw heaven open and he went up in a whirlwind. It's not very many prophets that you'll see in the Testament that said they saw heaven open. Not many of them that say, I saw the Lord in a dream. Or I had a dream, or I had a vision, but to see heaven open. Can you imagine how stable your mind has to be to see into the spirit like that? Amen? If we knew what was going on around us right now in this building, it would drive us insane. We would be out of our minds. If we saw what was happening in this building around us right now, there's a battle going on in this building right now. We can't see it. Demons and angels are fighting around us right now. We just can't see it. They're battling for the souls of the one that might not even be sure why they're even here. But we can't see it. If we saw the activity, I mean, these are not small creatures. They're, 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 they're probably going through the ceiling and through the building, that, but we can't see it. Because we're, our mind and our eyes, thankfully, because we couldn't handle it anyway, are on this side. Amen? But when you get to a place to where your mind is teeter-tottering back before the two, you see stuff. When my mother was sick, when she first got sick the first time, and she had a seizure, she was 70% brain dead, or so they said. And she was laying there... Um, in the hospital, and my, my brother had just left. Good thing he had just left my sister was there because it would have been a mess if he would have told him what, he told, what she told my sister. So I'm just glad that the right one was sitting there in the room when she started talking. But all of a sudden, she hadn't said a word. All of a sudden, she opens her eyes and starts talking. And my sister's looking like, this is new. And she said, do you see these things? And my sister's like, oh, God, my mom was out of her mind. She said, and she was shaking, and she was gripping the bed, and she was trying, like she was trying to get out of the room. She said, you don't see these things in here? And she's like, Mama, what are you talking about? She said, these things, they're fighting. They have swords. It's shining. It's bright. It's clicking. It's swords. It's big things. These big creatures, you don't see these big things in here fighting? They're moving the bed. You can't feel it? She said, they're all around you, too. You, you can't see these things fighting? And she said, all of her little theology went out the window. <laughs> and then she says, wait a minute, mama. Say that again. And that's when she realized, wow, they really are fighting for us. Because she was out of her mind, she could see. So what we call the curse Allow her to see what was there to save her soul and keep her from dying. Amen? And she went from being 70, 90% brain dead to 30 days later walking out the hospital. So my sister said, let me pray so the right ones win. 
So she started praying. So the right side wins. So when you have an urge to pray for something or someone, please do it. Please do it. Because you may be swaying the battle by your words. Amen. And when she told me that, I was just like, I'm glad y'all are there and not me. Bless the Lord. Because wow, that was just amazing. And I've always, I've always remembered that when she said that. And I said, do we really, can we really handle seeing sometimes we can request some crazy stuff from God. God, I want to see this. I want to see this. I never say that because I'm thinking, I, I don't want to see that. I've, saw, I've heard something for three seconds and about drove me insane. And it's because I was sleeping and God allowed me to hear the screams of hell for three seconds. That's all I could take. It took me almost a month to recover. My husband said it took me about a month to recover. I'm like, I was just in the bed crying. I couldn't do nothing for a month. Amen. So look at what's happening here. He says, he saw the heaven open and the Holy Ghost is saying, not, no other prophet, not many other prophets have seen that. So he, that's why he's saying, I regard, regard his worth because of his, what he's done and who he is. So he preferred his worth over others. Not respect the person, he valued his worth. Amen. He also had great success in his ministry. Also, the whole nation flocked to him. Some rose to a great design, and some noble, as noble as Aaron, as John did, or as many claims were welcome. Amen? So many people had been born of the women, had been great. And guess what? And then Jesus turns right around and says, nonetheless, he's least in the kingdom. So I'm thinking, God, how can he Go from being your favorite, not favorite, but you know what I mean. The greatness of John the Baptist, to then you turn and say, but he is the least in the kingdom of heaven. Those who, are, those, who are, those who are the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Those who are in the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. How was that possible when you just described what you what you thought about John? How how you in, in the word and see because we see one or two words, but we got to remember he's talking to people that understand the Old Testament. So when he when he compared them to a reed, they knew exactly what he was talking about. They had the revelation of what it meant for it to be compared to a reed. We're thinking, oh, what's a stick? What's what? It means nothing to us. But because of their culture, they knew exactly what Jesus Christ was talking about. So he spoke to them according to their culture. Amen. So now, John's mission was uniquely privileged because he prepared the way for the Messiah and the kingdom greater than he. But those in the kingdom of heaven, now that Jesus Christ has come, have a greater privilege because they have actually entered the kingdom and his new covenant and become partakers in the new covenant through the blood of Christ. So he said, we're greater because we, John died before seeing it. We were here to see the fulfillment of it. That makes it greater because that's why he said to us, greater works of these will you do. Why? When I leave. Jesus Christ tells us, when I leave, you're going to do greater works. Well, God, you, you're God. How can we do greater works than Jesus? Because you're going to have the Holy Ghost. I am still limited to the bounds of this physical flesh. I mean, because I chose to become a man. But when I leave, the Holy Ghost will be all over the world at the same time. And so all the things I'm doing now will have the capability of being done all over the world at the same time. Not just where I am physically. That's how we do the greater works. We're not doing anything different from what he did. The Holy Ghost gives the capacity for it to be done everywhere at the same time. That's why somebody here is preaching a word on emotions, and you may get a call from somebody in Germany, and the same word got preached. And in Italy, the same word got preached. Why is everybody, then you go on TikTok, here it is, emotions, here it is, coming again. Why? Because the Holy Spirit says, I will send the word out, and 80% of the people that's listening will be in tune with what the word said. And you'll find pastors that will be preaching the same thing in different congregations on the same day. Amen? Greater works. Amen? 
John was imprisoned and executed before Jesus' reign was established through the death of his resurrection. Amen. You can find that in Acts 2, 32 to 36. Romans 1 and 4 also. So now the disciples enjoyed the present reign of the Christ. They enjoyed the blessings that John, that John yearned for but didn't get a chance to get. That's why he said the least of y'all that are keeping was still greater than him. Because he didn't get a chance to enjoy the blessings and the fruit of his labor. Amen. Amen. Matthew 13 and 17. The description of the Old Testament prophets in, uh, in Peter talks about 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, uh, displays the prophets that they're talking about, that Jesus Christ is talking about, saying John, John did not see it. 1 Peter is talking about the prophets that, that gained, that did not be able to see the promises of what they were speaking. So you can find that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 through 12. Uh, I'm going to read it real quick. It says, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come to you, searching what or what manner of time the, sp the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow, unto whom it is revealed that unto themselves but unto us did minister these things which are now reported by you by them and have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sit down from heaven. We just said that. Which the things of the angels desire to look to. They desire what we are, what we have. That's why he said, who is man that, are, that thou art mindful of him? They're, they're baffled. That, that They're asking God, who is man that you're so mindful of them? That you placed them. Look, look where you placed them at, Lord. Look, look, look at the level where you placed them at. A little lower than the angels. Who are these little humans you made? What, why do they mean so much to you? I think we need to be grateful <laughs> that God loves us and the grace that, we're, that he's extending to us. Amen? Amen? This one right here, verse 12, has always got me. So we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Not a lot. But uh, verse 12 has always confused me. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. I've always been confused on what that means. I'm thinking, you know, somebody getting ready to fight. I mean, when you start talking about violence and force, I come from a family where I understand violence and I understand force. Amen? And so, in my mind, I'm thinking, we about to listen. So it's out, ching, ching, ching. It's, it's, but that's not what they were talking about. Amen? To use force. The Greek word for to use force, it means to force one's way into a thing. The idea here is that before John, the kingdom could only be viewed in the light of prophecy. But now it was being preached by John and men were pressing into it with a passion that resembled violence and desperation. They were violent to get the word. They were desperate in their spirits to get the word. Amen. They appeared as though they would seize it by force. Multitudes just thronged John to become his disciples. The forceful mindset of the people in the biblical times expresses the earnestness that men must have in getting rid of sin today. Amen. All satanic powers, the world, and standing true when relatives oppose us, people are going to come against you. Matthew 10, we, Minister Sharp just taught that. Matthew 10, 34 to 39. Amen? So there was a passion to know the truth. There's a violence at metamorphosis right now. There's people in metamorphosis that look, you ain't going to look. If you ain't going to teach, sit down somewhere. That's the mindset that's be, that we're beginning to have. If you're not going to teach, go, go have a seat. So put somebody up there that's going to teach because we ain't got time for all of that. There, there's a violence to press and know the word. There's a, there's a violence, there's, there's a desperation for the word right now in, in, at our church. You can feel it. There's just, I want to know the truth. They come up to, Sister Blunt comes up afterwards, let me see this thing, you'll know what, write this. So just take the paper. There's a violence to want to know it. 
Amen? The people are pushing. They're, they're pushing to know the truth. They're, they're pushing to get the truth. They want to push past the emotions of it all. They want to push past the pomp and stance. And look, what does the word say about what we're going through? What does the word say about what we're dealing with? What does Jesus Christ say about that? Amen? We're saved by grace, not by works. You do works because you're saved. But if you're doing works because you want to be saved, then you're going to go to hell doing works. Because salvation is a gift of grace only. That's it. It's a gift of grace only. There's nothing that you can do to earn it. If that, the, if that was the case, people would dictate salvation to other people. We couldn't be in charge of salvation because we wouldn't even deem half the folks worthy to be saved. Nope, not you. Nope, not you. Nope, not you. Nope, not you. Not you either. No, definitely not you. Thank God that is, that is Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost and not us. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for who he is. Amen. Amen. So then he goes on in verses 13 to 15, and he starts to uh, compare the two. Amen. When he, uh, in verses 13 to 15 of chapter 11, he's comparing the two. For all the prophets and law of the prophets until John, if you're willing to accept this, he has allowed you to come. He who, he who have ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Now I'm going to go over some quick things that Elijah and Jesus Christ both did. And uh, yeah, we may be close to not making it. We may be close to not making it. We'll see. Amen. So let's look at the comparisons. Number one, both were announced with the same spirit and power. 2 Kings 1 and 9. Luke 1 and 17. Both were familiar with deserts and solitude. 1 Kings 17 and 3. 19 and 4. Luke 1 and 8. And I, I, can, I can probably email these to people that want these notes. Because I, I'm, I'm I know I'm going kind of fast now. They were both similar to governments and lived and lived simply. 2 Kings 1 and 8. Both were fearless and bold to rebuke kings. 1 Kings 18, 17 to 18. 2 Kings 1, 9 through 6. Matthew 14 and 4. Kings wanted to kill them. 2 Kings 1, 9 through 6. Of course, Matthew 4, 3 and 4. Both were prone to discouragement. Remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? He only kept Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal, swallowed them up with the water, and then ran from Jezebel. All in the same, in the same day. <laughs> in the same little, same little time. And he discouraged. Oh, that's killing me, God. I'm the only one. I'm out here by myself, God said. And guess what? He was hiding up underneath a reed tree then. <laughs> he was on the juniper tree and reeds then, found amongst the reeds. He was being tossed. Amen. But both, they were preachers of righteousness. Both incurred enmity by a queen, Jezebel and Herod's wife. Both had great influence over Israel. They were subjects to prophecy. This is the one I like, though. They both have been or will be the forerunner of the Messiah. John, before the first advent, Malachi 3 and 1. Somebody grab Malachi 3 and 1. And Elijah, before the second advent, Malachi 4, 5, and 6. Somebody grab Malachi 3 and 1. And then the same person just switching over to Malachi 4, 5, and 6. I'm going to start over. Malachi 3 and 1, King mm -hmm. James Version. Behold, I will send a messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. 4, 5, and 6. Did you get both of them? 4, 5, and 6. Matthew, um, I'm Chapter sorry, Malachi 4, four Malachi 5, and 6. Got it. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the, smite the earth with a curse. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, a lot of people will argue who the witnesses are that's coming back, and they'll argue that one of them is not Elijah. But right there, Malachi clearly tells you that one of them will be. 
um, Elijah. So um, I'm not sure where the argument is. The people are still arguing who the two witnesses are going to be. I say it don't make a difference to me. I'm hoping not to be here. I'm, I'm hoping not to even be here. So I'm not even trying to trying to figure out who the witnesses are going to be. Sister Mavis got it. Got it. She got it too. Amen. So now, what happens? All of a sudden, in verse 16, something happens. He goes from talking about John the Baptist and talking about how great he is to turning around and speaking to this generation right here. He turns around now and starts comparing them to something. Amen? Verses 15, 16, he says, but what shall I say to this generation? It is like a child sitting in the marketplace and calling their playmates. We have played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We danced a dirge, and you did not mourn. Amen. For John came neither eating and drinking, and they say he is a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom justifies her deeds. I'm going to try to do this in seven minutes. Amen. So now Christ goes from praising John the Baptist to suddenly turning around and approaching them said, look, you guys have enjoyed the ministry and his apostles, but you did it all in vain. Amen? It's all been in vain. This generation, who, are you, who did you come to serve? What did you come to do? You're like children playing in the marketplace. Amen? Jesus condemns those who had John among them and did not profit from his ministry. Amen? Sometimes we have people sitting around us and we don't pay them any attention because they don't look the part we think they ought to look. They don't talk the way we think they ought to talk. They don't hang out where we think they ought to hang out. So we'll dismiss them. Amen? And don't realize what you got in front of you. Should have been picking their brain all this time instead of, instead of running away from them. Amen? Trying to figure out what they were all about. Amen? So there's no great absurdity than which they were guilty of who have good preaching among them and are never better because of it. Amen? Now, now he's bringing it on home to where we at. Amen? It's hard to say what they're like. The similitude is taken from a common custom among Jewish children at their play who are who play with children. They imitate fascists. They imitate grown people. They imitate... Uh, at their marriages and funerals, they're running around, they're rejoicing, they're lamenting, they're lament, uh, imitating everybody, all in jest, but it's made no real impression on them. Amen? So what he's saying is, look, this is the cause of great unfruitfulness and perversion. When people are under the means of grace, this is the thing, when someone is under the means of grace, this is what he's saying. You are... Because you're not operating in it, you're like children. Of, the people that are under the means of grace is that they're like the children sitting in the marketplaces. They are foolish as children, frowned on as children, mindless and play as children, but they do not show themselves men in understanding. They're, so there will be some hope in him. So what they're saying is, look, I am angry because you're operating in grace and I'm not. So instead of me trying to get attached to find out what you're doing, I would rather just talk about you and demean your character. Well. I'd rather just throw you under the bus. Amen? Let's bring it on down to where we're living at. Amen? So now, so we have some people, there was a very good reason for grace. We find that we're slothful uh, in, in operating in, in graceful things because some, some people just love to be there. And he's telling them, you're like children in the marketplace. You see things going on around you, and you're not mature enough to handle it. Amen? So you don't understand how you, you never learn how to operate in grace. You never learn how to operate in mercy. You never learn how to operate in anointing because you're like children in the marketplace watching other people play. You never, you never step off the bench and get out there and, and, and find out what's going on. You're just watching other children play. Amen? So he said, their hands, their heads, their hearts are full of the world. And the cares of the world choke the word. Amen. Ephesians 33 and 1 and Amos 8 and 5. You can read those when you have time. And they are sturdy and they divert their own thoughts from everything that's serious. Thus the markets they are and there they sit. In these things their heart are at rest and by them they resolve to abide. 
he especially reflects on the scribes and the Pharisees who had a proud conceit about themselves. Therefore, to humble them, he compares them to children. Because they, they don't like that. Don't ever compare a Pharisee to something that's not proud and standing out and got the best seat in the church and you know I got to come sit in the plush seat and I got to walk in with an entourage and don't compare me to a foolish child so he compared them to a children to humble them amen and their behavior as child's play so he said look you guys verse 17 the great thing he aims at is the melting of our wills in compliance with the will of God it's all about he said we played the harp you didn't dance you never conformed to the will of the word. You, did the, you had everything before you, and you did nothing with it. Amen? So you'll stand without excuse on the day of judgment. Because he will replay to you the days when you heard the word and chose to do nothing. He'll replay to you the day where the word found you in your mess, and you chose not to repent. All these things, your whole world will flash. You'll stand in judgment. He will replay for you all those things. Amen. He said he had piped to us grace and mercy. Amen. And warned us of calamities and afflictions. And they chose to set themselves one against another, another instead of bowing down and following Christ. He said them, look at what y'all are doing. He has taught his ministers to change their voice. Galatians 4 and 20. Sometimes to speak in thunder from Mount Sinai, sometimes in a small, still voice from Mount Zion. He has tempered the ministers to know how to teach. Amen? He's tempered them to know how to operate in their anointing. There are some people that are very strong, and you don't have to be really calm with them. You can just say, Cynthia, stop what you're doing. Just quit it, because you're out of control. But if you say you're out of control to somebody else, they may leave the church. You have to know how to handle each person's personality. That's why I know I'm not a pastor, so bless the Lord. Ain't got to worry about that. I just teach. Amen? Verses 18 and 19, look, this, and this is what he's saying. Look, let's not be, we cannot allow, afford to allow the opportunities that God give us to go by us. We can't allow those opportunities to go by us. But that's what he said. We played the heart. You didn't dance. I, I, I laid everything out for you to conform your will to my word and you chose to do nothing. You're that generation. You came out of St. John the Baptist, but you're that generation. Amen? So this, verse 18 and 19, and we're going to stop right there after that. We'll pick this up uh, later on. As a matter of fact, we're going to stop right there. We'll pick up, we'll add 18 and 19 to next week. 18 and 19 is good. I wish I had time. 18, 19 is good. That's what it says when we, we hurt other people when we don't understand stuff. It's talking about it's getting into hurt. Verses 18, 19. We're going to get it to next week. And we're going to close out right there. When he says, John came neither eating and drinking, and you say he's a demon. Son of man came drinking. You said, look at him. He's, he's a drunk. We're going to address that one next week and finish this chapter on out. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word on tonight, oh God. We thank you, Father God, that you love us with an everlasting love, and you'll not leave us ignorant of Satan's devices. So God, we thank you that we have a church and we have leaders that have desire for us to learn and to grow. So God, we don't take that lightly, and we don't take it for granted. So we will grow, we will learn, and we will move forward in your word daily as we live our lives daily. We'll be leaders in our community, oh God, and we'll take your word out, oh God, and we'll, we will fulfill the great commission of making disciples. So God, we thank you and give you praise for everyone that has labored in the back. Father God, bless the fruit of their hands and their wombs, oh God, bless their homes and their families. We give your name the glory and the honor for all you've done and all you're going to do in, in this ministry. In Jesus' name, amen.